So do a countdown. 18. Okay, here's the scenario. You've just inherited security responsibility for one of the largest applications in your company. It's a big beast, it's ugly, it's never gone through any security due diligence before. So being a good practitioner, you decide. Source code review, threat modeling, and results are less than encouraging. There's SQL injection, cross-site scripting, a little bit of XML injection, authorization being done on the client but not the server. So you take a deep breath. And you ask yourself the million dollar question. What do you do, you do now? So this is an open question to the audience. What would you do if anyone's been in a scenario like this? You just got an application, just reviewed it, it's terrible, it's been around for a long time, it's critical, what would you do? Rewrite, refactor, okay, anything else? What's that? Redesign, re... You could use dependency ejection, for those familiar with the Spring Framework, there's a lot of things you can do. But typically, you're going to come up with things like refactoring, right? And that's going to be expensive. So we're here to talk about another way of doing that. So welcome, everybody, to AOP and Security. My name is Rohit Sethi. I work for Security Compass. And this is Nish Bala. Hi, everybody. My name is Nish Bala. I'm with Security Compass. And we are going to talk about AOP and uh, different ways of using AOP to help prevent various types of attacks that Rohit was just introducing you to. Okay, and for those of you who don't know Security Compass, uh, basically we're a company that specializes in application security. We do, uh, you know, consulting and we do training around this area, but this is our bread and butter. Okay, I need a volunteer. With, we, we have bribery. I know we don't, uh, we don't have beer, I'm sorry, but... All right. A Twix bar? We have one, okay. You can come up. Hey, what's your name? Frank. Frank. Sweet. Is everyone welcome, Frank? Okay. Despite what you think, Nish is an object, and Frank is an object. Already objectifying us. <laughs> They're instances of the person class, okay? Nish has this method called throw where he has a parameter ball, and Frank has a method called catch, where he's going to catch the parameter ball, like so. Excellent, no exceptions. <laughs> and then there's a return. Okay, that's great, everything worked as normal. Now I'm gonna show you something slightly different. I'm Rohit the Aspect. So again, I'm gonna throw the ball. But I catch it. Frank doesn't know that I caught it. Nish doesn't know that I caught it. I look at the ball and I say, this is funky, it's green. Didn't expect it to be green. Has a bunch of writing on it. Malicious characters. Malicious characters on this parameter. So I'm gonna throw an injection and uh, exception and that's it. It's gone. And that's the idea, fundamental idea behind aspect-oriented programming. And we're gonna get a little more into it, but please thank Frank again. So uh, we just saw that I was an object, Frank was an object, I made a call to Frank, Frank received it and he passed it back to me. That's basically traditional, object oriented, right? What we also saw was in the middle, 
Rohit came in and he was the aspect. The aspect actually stopped the call before it reached the second object, looked at it, it does an analysis and on the basis of the analysis decides whether it should allow this transaction to go forward or it should stop and drop the transaction or return it back to the parent object or, or the callee itself. Okay? Think of aspect as pretty much like a proxy, if you will, uh, when you're doing web pen testing, right? You have a proxy that sits in the middle. Uh, the browser doesn't really know about it. The server really doesn't know about it. You let the transaction go through. At the proxy level, you can either modify it, you can allow it through or drop the transaction. However, this is at runtime, so it's more like a runtime debugger, which is constantly monitoring for a particular transaction to go through, and if that transaction goes through, then it actually will look at it, examine it, see if a particular action should take place. If it should, it modifies it. If it should not, then it returns it back to the object, parent object itself. Okay, so you're all thinking this is a bunch of theory, what's going on. So let's see this really happen in real code, okay? This is Daffodil CRM. It is a great application because it's vulnerable to everything under the sun. It's open source and it's Java. Okay. Now, in the talk of CRM, for people who are not familiar with it, it's customer relationship management. We have this great idea of a, a lead, okay, which is a sales lead. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into Daffodil CRM and we're going to enter a couple of leads. So we'll enter one called a, a test. Everything is great. Let's try one with after test, something a little more malicious maybe. Script something, something, right? Submit. Now we're going to go back and take a, li a look at all of the leads that we have. Okay, so we refresh. And boom. Okay, cross-site scripting, so not a major vulnerability, right? Just a stupid little pop-up box that doesn't mean anything. I think that's true. What do you guys think? Yes, but it's persistent. It, it is persistent. You can steal cookies. You can steal cookies, yes. I, I guess... Um, Many of you might have seen it on OWASP as well. OWASP rates cross-site scripting as the most prevalent uh, attack vector in web applications. I guess uh, more than what 70, 80 percent of applications on the internet are supposed to be vulnerable to this. What can you really do with this, Roy? Well, if any of you have seen some of the kind of latest research that's going out with combined with cross-site request forgery and with AJAX, we can do a lot. Right In online banking, you can steal funds with just a single cross-site scripting anywhere in the application. Over here, we could probably steal information for every client who's in the CRM. Okay? So you can do a lot of damage with just a single cross-site scripting vulnerability. But that's not the focus of today's talk. So let's, let's look a little bit further. Okay, we're going to delete those leads. And we're going to go back to look at the actual source code. Right? This is Eclipse IDE. That's the integrated development environment. How many people have done some sort of development with Java or .NET here? Okay, so for you guys, this is probably look familiar. Uh, for everyone else, it, just stick with us. It's not going to be too uh, crazy. So we're going to actually look at the source code for what we just saw. So over here, we are going to look for a particular class called the new lead bean. New lead bean, if you're 